amazing, is it, Father, that you created us, that uh, you are the potter, we are the clay, and you created us, us cracked pots, Father oh God, so that the deeper the cracks, the deeper the crevices in our lives, the more hurt, the deeper the cracks, the more of your light we can shine through to other people. So, Father, we just praise you because you are glorious and you are awesome. And we may be aging, our faces may be cracking, <laughs> our joints may be cracking, but Father God, we just praise you that you, um, our inner radiance continues to grow and just help us to shine that forward throughout the day today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's all stand and exalt the name of Jesus. Amen.
seated. Wow, thank you, Pastor Sean. That was beautiful. I hate to interrupt the praise with the with announcements, but we're going to go there and then we'll come right back to praise. I don't know why this is dropping, so. But. All right, um, one quick thing that I do want to say that I've been reminded that because we are indoors here, even though it sort of feels like outdoors, we are required to wear masks. So only the speaker up here. Um, is allowed to be without a mask while we're up here. So if you don't have one, you didn't bring one, we do have extras in the back. So so please uh, help yourself. I'll just go down here. <laughs> just be sure. All right, our announcements today. Um, today, as I said, is Tuesday. I get confused as I normally do Wednesdays, but tomorrow night, Wednesday, we will have sanctuary right here in, uh, in the tabernacle. That's at 6.30. At 7 p.m., the Gospel Music Ministry um, will will be featuring our very own Tyler Sato. Here, tomorrow night. Also, um, we have the organ concert tomorrow night at 7:30. Thursday night, right here again in the Tabernacle, we have prayer song, which is a, a very beautiful uh, contemplative kind of Taze worship. And then we have Vespers on Friday night also, and that's over at the Thornley Chapel. So some form of worship every day, every morning, and every night. So, so yes, hallelujah is correct. I just want to remind you, and every time I do this, I expect to see snowflakes come down like a Hallmark movie. But um, we do have our Christmas luncheon. Our women's Christmas luncheon is coming up. Can't be too soon, December 12th. And we do have tickets um, available for this. You can purchase them online. Or Miss Natalie in the front will be over at the hub or the office. Office. At the office. Okay, at the camp meeting office across the street on Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, right after Bible hour. You can go over if you prefer to get your ticket in person and not online. So there are flyers on the back table if you'd like to pick some up to share with your friends. Our Ocean Road Beach Church on Sunday morning is at 9 o'clock up at the boardwalk, and that's our contemporary worship service. And then in our free auditorium uh, on Sunday morning at 10.30, we will have Dr. Duffy Robbins, who will be bringing the word to us, and Duffy will be with us all next week uh, for Bible Hour as well. So we hope you can come back and join us for that. Okay. Um, our offering, as you all know, our offering, uh, we are not passing baskets right now, but there are many different ways that you can give. So um, you can uh, put something in the offering desk on the way out. You can give online. You can write a check. Uh, lots of ways to give. So let's pray for that offering right now. Oh, Father God, you, you are the good and perfect giver. We could never outgive you, Father God. We praise you and we magnify you and we glorify you for each and every perfect gift that comes from above. Father, help us to be conscious today of every single one of those blessings. Help us to be conscious of the things that we normally just take for granted and just gloss over and to see that every single thing we have is a gift from you. That in you we live and we move and we have our being. So, Father, help us to be cheerful givers, and as Sandy always says, hilarious givers, and, <laughs> and really, really give back to you just such a small portion of what you've already given to us. Please find it in your hearts to bless the camp meeting this morning with your gifts. And in Jesus' precious name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to now sing our chorus for the week, which is Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of God. If anybody's in need, if you didn't pick it up um, on the music stand in the back, the ushers can give you one if you just raise your hand.
week with us. He and his beautiful wife, Claire. Um, they are, he is the pastor of the Gateway Church. Has two campuses, one in Bridgewater and one newer one in Leamington, New Jersey. Believe it or not, he has been pastoring for over 20 years. Can we get an amen? Yeah. Uh, he started leading worship when he was 16 years old. And he has such a heart for God. And he is fueled by the Holy Spirit and coffee. Uh, and it is good to our, so let's give a welcome to Pastor Sean.
just what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. This is a new day that you've made. And regardless of what we're currently facing personally, God, we're going to choose to rejoice in the glad things. God, sometimes, well, all the time, praise and worship is not based on how we're feeling. It's based on who you are. And you're good all the time. And God, we just want to thank you that you're always faithful. You're always with us. And at every moment of every day of our lives, is right and it's appropriate to worship you. Father, we love you. We just commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. 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 Which means change how you think. 
A lot of times we think of this word repentance as if you're saying you're sorry, and people have this kind of expression or understanding with someone like whipping themselves in the back like some priest used to do. But it's, it's not, it, I'm sure remorse and regret may be, may be associated with this word repentance, but repentance basically means to do a 180. It means you're going in one direction, and you realize, oh, I was wrong, and then you go in another direction. You go in the right direction. So many of us were going the wrong direction, and Jesus has this way of changing things around and showing us the right way. He brings us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. All right? So, and so this is what this word repentance means, just to change how you think. And sometimes we think wrong about things. When Jesus arrives, he begins his ministry by preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He means let's change how we think about things. And I think, you know, it's really important the way we think and believe in life. Because sometimes you can be so sincere, but so sincerely wrong in what you believe. Right? And so it's really important how we think and believe. And I just believe, and this is what I preach at our church all the time, is I believe that the most important thing about your life is not your education, it's not your family, it's not your career, it's, it's not uh, how wealthy you are, how intelligent you are. None of that matters, really. It's what Paul kind of associated his whole life around. The most important thing about your life is the way you see and you understand God to be like. Amen. It's the most important thing because whether you believe in Jesus or some representation of him or some other God or gods, or maybe you're an atheist and you don't believe in God at all, for those who are watching online. But it, the way you think about God, it changes the framework of your paradigms and values and perceptions about this life Amen. and what's important. And so who is Jesus and what is he like? It's the most important thing about you. In Matthew 16, I completely straight from my notes, but Matthew 16, Jesus asks this really important question. He says, who do you say that I am? And I think this is a question that we all need to be able to answer. Is who is Jesus and what is he like? And Peter is the one who gets it right. He says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. For flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, he goes, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Right? This is the plot in this story of Jesus. Because we're talking about the kingdom of God. It's not a standard to live up to. It's the story of Jesus to live into. And in this story of Jesus, because history is precisely that. It's his story. It, life, this story, your story, it's not about you. It's about him. It's his story. And our life comes to life and to light in the context of his story. You want an amazing life? You want to discover your purpose and identity and calling? It's about getting to realize that this life is not about you. It's about him. Yes. And so, and in doing so, this is what happens. He says, he says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And a lot of people think that the church is built upon Peter, like he was the first pope. I'm going to say, that's garbage. Okay, that's not, the, that's not how this works. The context, we have to keep things in context. The context was the question. Who do you say that I am? Peter gets it right. Blessed are you. My church is going to be built on this rock. It's on the revelation of who Jesus is that Jesus is building his church. Okay? And then he says to Peter, you are Peter. First it was Simon. This is but it's like that name stinks. I'm going to give you the name Peter instead. Sorry for those of you whose name is Peter. My brother-in-law's name is, is, is Simon, so uh, I like the message. But, um, but he goes, you are Peter. And, uh, and, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I just find this really important, because Jesus justifies to Peter who he is and what he's called to do. And it's when we come to understand who Jesus is, he defines for us who we are and what we're called to do. Amen. He gives us identity and purpose simply through coming to an understanding of who Jesus is. And I just think that's beautiful. And I think this is what we have to define for people. is the reality of just the beauty and the love of Jesus that changes people's lives. Yes. Alright. So in this, in this understanding of, of uh, what we were talking about yesterday with justice, here's the kingdom of God, this is the way Jesus was defining it, but he doesn't really give us a real great definition of it when it comes to the kingdom of God. Instead, Jesus would come and he would tell a story. We got the, I'm going to talk louder so you guys can hear, can hear over the, uh, the uh, weed whackers in the back. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. So Jesus, when he comes, he comes preaching. He says, he, he would say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. His whole ministry was about the kingdom. 
He taught us to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes we make the kingdom of God all about getting there, but it was never about really getting there so much as it was about bringing there here. Amen. And being a part of it, that you're called to such a time as this. And we get to bring the kingdom realities here on earth, and so we have purpose and identity and calling and a mission to be a part of. And so he preaches the kingdom. He tells us to pray, let your kingdom come. And all the stories that he gives us. All the parables that he defines for us helped in defining what the kingdom of God is all about. And so in understanding this, in understanding the concept of the kingdom of God and what this is about, because this is the first thing you're going to see with your lives. How do you seek first the kingdom of God? And we have to keep things in context. And when we take a look at this, he defines the kingdom, not through a set of rules and regulations. He defines the kingdom through story. And he would say, the kingdom of God is like, and then a once upon a time would begin. And I just think that, you know, in a world of standards and due dates, and we compare our lives with other people, and we try and live up to certain things, the biblical way isn't to set a standard and say, live up to it. The biblical way is to tell you a story and invite you to live into it. Amen. To be a part of this. Like you actually get to be a part of the kingdom of God and his story that's taking place all over the earth. Because right now, whether you recognize it or not, Jesus would begin to preach. He would say, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he would tell a story. And then he would say, it's taking place right now. It's unfolding. It's near to you. The kingdom of God is it's at hand. And so, so many times we fail to see that right now, the story of the kingdom of God is taking place across the earth. And you can decide to live into it or not. And when we live into the story of Jesus... It reshapes the way we think, the repentance, right? It reshapes the way we think and believe and imagine and understand this world to be like. And so it changes the whole concept of things because everyone's got, a, hopefully you've got like a plan and a to-do list. But I don't want to think of the kingdom of God as one more thing that I have to do. You know, I got a lot to do. I got four kids. You know, I got a busy life. I got two churches to run. And so I'm like, you know, I gotta, in a world full of standards, we're like, I got to do this. We have to. We must. We should. We need. When it comes to the kingdom and the story, what will take place after you leave here? The opportunities are endless. The sky is the limit. This is what hope is all about. When you leave here today, who will you meet? Who will you encounter? Who can you pray for? What lives can you impact? Because this enables us to see life differently. It gives us purpose and meaning. It helps us to look at people differently. And everyone has a story. Sometimes we just look at the cover rather than reading the book. And we judge people. But really... This is about living into the story of the kingdom and making a difference in people's lives. And Jesus welcomes everyone to the table. Are you with me this morning? Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. And so here's the thing that I want to talk about, really. And we're going to define this over the next few weeks. Oh, the next few weeks, gosh, we're not going to be <laughs> Although I'm left on the beach, it's great. I got burnt yesterday, so. Uh, I can, it was weird, too. I got burnt here, here. And on my left ear, I was just, just like this ray of sun just hit me in a weird way. So, I won't do that again. Um, so, what are we talking about? Yeah, so I'm going to be I'm gonna be here for a few weeks. You're going to be here for a few days. And over the next few days, I wanted to find how, are we, how do we live into the kingdom of God? Because first, it's about changing how you think. It's your perspective. It's repentance. It's just switching things. And you know, one of the, when you think of a story, what makes a story great? You know, I, I've, because I have three daughters, I have seen every Disney princess movie there is. <laughs> Moana is still probably my favorite. But because I've watched, uh, whatever it's called, she's the princess, but it's, uh, wow. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's all I remember is the princess name. Um, but uh, I've seen every Disney princess movie. You know, something to take note in these movies is that there's always this balance between hardship, and trials, and difficulties, and then the victory that comes with it as we go through it. I think what makes a story great are the difficulties that we encounter. Some of the things I am most grateful for are the difficulties that I've been through. Because of what it produces in me. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, actually, too. But I think the dumbest story would be 
that the princess met her handsome prince, fell in love, got married, made babies, and lived happily ever after. That's the dumbest story possible. Because where are, where's the trials? And where are the, the, the difficult circumstances that we face? And where are the, the battles that have to be fought? Because real life is not perfect if you've been here for a while. Real life is full of mistakes and failures. And you know what? When we live according to a standard, all a standard teaches you is how far you've fallen. But in a story, a story makes room for mistakes and errors and failures because they are necessary in life for growth and maturity. Amen. And you know, it's the difficulties that we actually go through that actually make a good story. You look at all of the different stories that take place in the Bible. You look at church history. You think about all the movies that inspire people and storybooks that inspire people and Disney princess movies that inspire people. And it's always, it's always the difficulties and the circumstances that people have to go through and, and, and surmount and overcome that brings an inspiring story. And so if you have difficulties and you have, you have circumstances that you have to overcome, man, God loves you. You know, sometimes we, we, we go through these things in life and we're like, God, why would you do this to me? But you know what? The disciplines of God are not the absence of his love. The disciplines of God are the evidence of his love. Are you with me? You know, I just think this is really important to kind of really grab a hold of. Every great story has this balance of tragedy and victory. You know, and something that I, I, I had this job when I was 19. I was working for this guy at his delivery service. And he just loves, like, I don't know, he, he would always tell me where different quotes came from, like where, you know, Dead Ringer or Saved by the Bell or Toe the Line, you know, he, would, he would rule of thumb, he'd talk about all these expressions that we have, and he would tell me where these came from. And he had this little plaque of cards, and uh, on it was this, 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 uh, this quote by Theodore Roosevelt. And I just, uh, I picked it up and I just, I just memorized it, because I just, I loved what it said. And, and this is what this is the quote that said, and I just I want to live my life this way, and I want other people to live this li their lives this way. But it says, it says, um, it says, far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much, because they know they know not victory nor defeat. You know, and sometimes we live in this great twilight where we don't know victory, we're unwilling to take a risk, we don't want to step back in faith, and so we don't know victory, we don't know failure, but we have to have both in our lives. And this is kind of what this life is all about. My pastor has always preached for years, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. you got to take a risk sometimes and get out of the boat and step out in faith. And so if the kingdom of God is the story of Jesus that we get to live into, how do we live into it? And Jesus gives us this, he gives us this, uh, this, our first clue, basically, in John chapter 3, about living into the story of the kingdom. This is what he says in John 3, 3. He says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'll read it one more time. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you know, if becoming born again is the primary way that we live into the kingdom of God, or even just begin to see the kingdom of God, what does it mean to be born again? Because a lot of times we just simply associate it with water baptism, or you, you, you give your heart to Jesus. But you know, I think, that, I think that water baptism is a public outward declaration of your faith. That speaks of an occurring internal transformation that's going on. It's not like you go under the water and you come back up and whoop, I'm perfected. That's not how this works. You got a long way to go. Right? This life is a journey of discovering the goodness of God with all the trials and difficulties that we go through. And so, do you know that a hundred years ago, um, the phrase I am born again. Was seldom used. It was, uh, and it's a bit of an ego trip if you think about it. Like, I'm born again, like I did it. I've made it. I've accomplished it as if it's something that you did rather than something that God is doing. The phrase that was actually used more often 100 years ago was, and I love this, I was seized by the power of.
of great affection. I love that. Because it's not based on what we're doing, this process that we're going through. It's based on what God is doing. That God loves you just the way that you are. He just loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. Right? And he's working things out in our lives. And this is one of the ways that we actually begin to see the kingdom of God. It's, I was seized by the power of a great affection. And he's changing things in my life for my benefit. For, and so he's this refiner's fire. And this process of purification that we go through, it's necessary for each and every one of us. And what produces and establishes a great story for our own lives. And so I want to talk about the Apostle Paul this morning. Actually, this is a message I preached this past Sunday at Gateway. Because, um, you know, right now, with, with all that's going on in the world, I really honestly believe in my spirit that there, the stage is set to see God work in amazing ways across the earth. You know, when you look at all the, you know, revival is birthed out of uncertainty and difficulties and problems. When you look throughout the Bible and when you look at throughout church history, you see a move of God times of distress and persecution, and you know what? What's taking place in the earth right now with holy uncertainty, I just believe, I just have to believe that the stage is set to see God work in amazing ways, and I want to be in a position for it. I mean, who wants to miss a move of God, right? No one wants to miss a move of God. That's why we're called to such a time as this. We have to get our minds in the game and realize this is what repentance is all about. It's about seeing the kingdom of God. It's a story that you get to live into. You were created for such a time as this. The Bible, you know, so many Christians, they just live saved. The Bible inspires you. Live called. You were saved and called to a holy calling. Amen. Amen. And so... I want to look at the story of the Apostle Paul because if any man, if any person's life was just dramatically changed, Paul's life was seized by the power of great affection. Right? And let me just read this for you. This is from this is from Acts chapter 9. And it's an amazing story. And sometimes people, they just read a chapter a day to keep the devil away. That doesn't work, okay? You actually got to put yourself in the place. You have to meditate on the Word of God, all right? And it's that meditation, just kind of like absorbing it. It's amazing how you can read things once and then reread them and get something new out of it. Because the Holy Spirit can bring new things to life, all right? All right, so it goes like this. Sorry, verse 1. This is, this is Acts chapter 9. Paul saw, uh, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's what they call Christianity, the way, um, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hands and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. But before behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias, come and in, lay hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jeru at Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples of Damascus, and immediately 
You proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. What a transformation, right? This is like within a week. All of a sudden, he's going from killing, killing Christians to actually raising up Christians. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this man who has made, made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his, this name? And, and has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving Jesus was the Christ. Now Saul is this undeniable historical, historical figure uh, who stood in opposition to the early church and who imprisoned and oversaw the execution of so many Christians. And this figure, um, his dramatic change is something that we have to pay attention to because it's a proof that Jesus Christ is that risen. Okay? Because a lot of times, critics of the Bible they will dissect the Bible and they will pull out um, dates and facts or whatever uh, from the Old Testament primarily and try to prove that it's not true. And because of that, they will try and discount the whole Bible. But our faith is not based on those facts. Our faith is based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have no reason to believe. Okay, and so people will people will point to the fact that there is there is uh, not too much evidence that substantiates the fact that Israel was under captivity in Egypt for 430 years. All right, fine. You want to mess with that? Go ahead. It's, you're probably not going to believe anyway. But here's the here's the point: when you look at a man like Paul, Saul, right? You look at this man Saul who becomes Paul. What changes a man like this? Who goes on to build the very thing, the church, he goes on to build the very thing that he set his life against so harshly. What changes a man like that? And just in a matter of a few days, because critics of the Bible, they'll try and they'll try and dissect and take apart all these other things in the new in the old testament. But they won't touch a man like this. When you have someone who is an eyewitness account of the risen Lord, basically, and you have an encounter with him. And all of a sudden, his life is so dramatically changed. What changes a man like this, other than the fact that he had an encounter with the risen Jesus? Okay? And so you can try and discount all these other things, but you can't discount Paul. Look at his life. And Saul was a man who had everything going for him. He had the career. He had the education. He had the family lineage. He was perfect under the law. He had all this going for him. And this is what he's trying to identify his life with. And he goes on, and he eventually in Philippians 3, he would write this. He says, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Basically, I could one on anybody. <laughs> Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness of the law, blameless. Saul, Saul, Saul's life he, all he did was he served self, but it, just, it, it was a life that masqueraded in serving God, but it was a life that just served self. It was all about him and his story. It was not about God's story at all. And sometimes we identify our lives by our family and our education and our intelligence and whatever it may be, but that's not the most important thing about you. We make life all about ourselves, and sometimes we can become so full of ourselves that we miss out on this life of actually participating in the kingdom of God. And how can God choose a man to serve him when he has too much to lose? Sometimes, you know, in life, we just, we're not willing to take to, to count the cost. Serving God. Being a part of this kingdom it means there's going to be trials and difficulties that we face. And what will you do when you come up to those things? You just throw them the top. Jesus gives us something worth living for. Amen. He gives us meaning and purpose and value. And it's the things that we actually go through in life actually develop this hope and this faith and this love within us. It positions us as children of God. And so here's Saul, and you know, I, just, I just look at this man's life, and he's just so full of himself. And how can God choose a man to serve him when he's just so much to lose? He's got his education to lose. He has his, he has his, uh, his, all his family lineage and all, this types of, all these things that he just built and based his life upon. 
Sometimes we just build and base our life upon things and we identify our lives with things that in life that really don't matter. In Mark 8, this is what Jesus would say. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this is not easy. And you know, I, you know, sometimes you look at the Greek words and, and, and they mean different things, but this word deny, it really just means to reject. But you're rejecting yourself. You're saying it's, to, it's basically to disown, to, to say no. You know, it's really hard to say yes to God when you have to say no to yourself. But this is what it means to follow Jesus. And you know, this, this, um, this phrase, take up your cross, we have a wrong understanding of that. Because a lot of times for people, it means to, to get through something, right? This is my burden to bear, bear, my burden to bear, this is my cross to carry. As if it's something seasonal that you have to get through for a little while. But to that audience back then, the cross had one thing and one thing only. It meant death. It meant death by the most brutal and humiliating way possible. A crucifixion. And you look at the martyrs of church history and you look at people's lives who are just so willing to lay down their lives and to count the cost. To follow Jesus. This is just an amazing thing. You, know, you, you can't just overlook the sacrifice of people. People overlook the sacrifice of Jesus. And they take it for granted. Sometimes the good news becomes old news to people or stale news. Mm. But it was always, it's like we have to kind of like, I never want the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross to lose its effect on my life. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. I want this power of it to exist in my life today. It's just something I want to live for. I, I don't belong to me. I belong to him. We were bought with a price, and he just gives us something to live for. You know, it's usually really hard to say yes to God when you realize it means saying no to yourself. And when you consider the stories in the scriptures and those in church history who laid down their lives, they're the ones who experience the move of God. And what will it cost you? Because, well, you know, this kingdom, it's, it's, what, it's what's worth living for. And you haven't realized it yet. We don't get to live here very long. And what will you do with your life? I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize, what was I doing with it? I was just wasting my life just on me when this life was really about him. It's not about my story. It's about his story. Amen. That's what this kingdom is all about. He invites you to participate and to actually live into it. Yes. And that's the thing with the cross. When it comes to take up your cross, a lot of times we look at something as if it's a seasonal thing, but it's actually a positional thing. It's not something to just get through. It's something to get into and to be identified by. It changes us. It's like it's, you get seized by this power of a great affection where it's not just about your life, it's about his life. And you see Saul. Saul's life was seized by the power of a great affection where Saul had to die in order for Paul to be resurrected. You with me? It's something that he had to get into, right? And then Jesus just kind of wrecks his life in order to do it. But it just changes everything about him. And he actually would go on and he would write, he would write this about himself. He would write this. He would say, he would say, not that I, he would go on and, I don't know where the scripture verse is over here, but he'd actually find in Philippians 3, he's like, all that I had going for me, I consider lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and being found in him. And you know, you have to look at this man's life, right? I mean, imagine what those three days must have been like. Paul, Saul, right? I mean, it must be this life-altering moment for him. He's, imagine being struck blind for three days. And here he is, he's got the education and the career and the charisma and he's, all his passions and convictions. And then all of a sudden, he had an encounter with 
Jesus and everything changes in an instant. Amen. And now, he struck blind. And we don't have much to go off of, but we, what we do know is that he doesn't eat or drink for three days. This man is probably miserable. And in those three days of darkness, this is probably the beginning of him being able to see for the very first time. You can't even see the kingdom unless you're born again. And here's Paul, Saul. Saul's being born again in this moment. He's being seized by the power of great affection. Saul's coming to an end, and Paul's discovering the new beginning. There are things that you can die you don't get a resurrection without a death. That's how this works. You don't get a new beginning without suffering coming to an end. And this is the very thing that's taking place in Saul's life right now. And something that's so necessary for each and every single one of our lives, too. You know, in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus states that the enemy comes for three reasons. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you know, he can only kill, steal, and destroy what you're not willing to let go of. Right? The things that we built our life upon, the things that we kind of identify with, those are the things that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, the things that you're unwilling to let go of. What are you willing to let go of to follow Jesus? I think this is a really important question we have to ask ourselves. Because you know, I think we become untouchable to the enemy. When we prize the kingdom above everything else that we value. You know, it says actually in Revelation chapter 12, this is 10 through 11. It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. And the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down. He accuses them day and night before God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. You know, you're not actually going to be able to, it's like we actually overcome the enemy by understanding the power of the cross, and we come to overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony. Everyone needs a personal history with Jesus. When you have a testimony, when you've seen God's faithfulness in your life before, you can believe that he'll be faithful again, right? Like I, I, I told you last, uh, last um, I told you yesterday, you know, my wife and I, we, I remember we, uh, we, 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 when we first got married, we tied all the money that was in our savings, just believing that God was going to be for us. And I didn't want to do it at first. I didn't want to count that cost. And I was like, my wife's going to have to come down and tell me that she heard the same thing. There's like, no way I'm giving up everything in my savings. we got rent to pay and bills to pay. She comes down the stairs almost at that moment and says, we need to give up all the money. Dang, what's wrong with you? Right? Like, and, and, uh, and so we did. We, we gave all the money that we had. And I was just starting a painting business, and God showed himself faithful, right? He just showed himself faithful. And because he was faithful back then, I know I have faith now, the stronger faith that I'll be more faithful as we move forward in this journey with him. It's about counting the cost and watching God work. But you'll never have a testimony if you don't count the cost. Yes. You will never have a testimony. You'll never have a story to tell people. If you don't count the cost and follow Jesus, you want a great story, you want a great adventure, you want life in the spirit and get to know this kingdom of God, and we have to lay our lives down, and there we see the signs and wonders and the miracles taking place. And this is what this life is all about. We're so oftentimes we're too scared to get out of the boat and step out into the water. And here's, 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 here's Saul, right? He, he was completely oblivious to the kingdom of God, and Jesus takes everything away from him. Yeah. Would you still serve God if he took everything away from you? And we would like to say yes. My wife, was, she's not here this morning. She, her, her health suffers from time to time. She had an allergic reaction to a, um, an antibiotic three years ago. It wrecked her system. And, um, and uh, she was bedridden for a while. I had to carry her around. And it was just, and with four kids, you can imagine, it was just, it was really, really dreadful. Just, and I, I'm, I'm working, we've got the, the churches. In 2018, we opened up the second church. And, 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 you know, there were times where it was just like, man, I just want to give up. With everything that's been taking place, you know, and, and if, 
even for her, like, because life was not the same. Her kidneys were wrecked. Um, you know, just there was just so much pain all throughout her body, her tendons that some of the some of the things that we read were tendon ruptures, right? So she couldn't walk, her muscles were fried, and and, um, and so just living life that way and just continuing to trust God and believe, and we didn't see a miraculous change to place, but we just decided we're just gonna continue to count the cost and we're gonna continue to serve God because we believe it's faithful. <laughs> You know what? My wife's walking around now. She's practically healed. It's just a, she's almost there. It's been a slow process, but God has shown himself faithful. He's provided. He's given us the grace and the energy to walk through this, this storm, and he's walked through it every moment of the way with yes. us. And God is just so good. And you know what? Even even when I just come to a point where I was like, God, I just want to give up. It's like, I don't know if this is a cost that I can, I can handle. But he just seems somehow gives us the grace to do it. And you know what? It's, it's, just, it's just an amazing thing. And so you know what? I'm at a point now where like even if my health suffer, I'm going to continue to count the cost. I'm going to continue to believe. I'm going to continue to serve God because there ain't nothing in this world that's worth living for the hair. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people try to like, you know, put, Jesus says, yeah. it's like he says in, in this Mark chapter 8, he, he's talking about, it was, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And what does a prophet man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Those who try to find their life, they end up losing it. The aim of this life is not to find it. The aim of this life, being a disciple, is to lose it. You'll never find your life saving it. You only find your life. And it's in the losing of our lives that we actually discover what real living is all about. And I think I have gone over my time. <laughs> you guys good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there are a lot of people who just couldn't handle it. You look at Matthew 19. There's the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and basically he's kind of miserable. What am I not doing right? Follow all the commandments as well. You know, as well, if you would just give to the poor, you'd have treasure in heaven. And then when you do, come follow me. And he couldn't do it because he was identified around his wealth. It was too much of a cost. You think of Saul, he was identified around his career and his fame, his reputation. I wanted to strip all that away from him to show him what real living was all about. Are you willing to count the cost? It's a question we all have to ask ourselves. And I think life is a journey. Sometimes we're just not there yet. God slowly shows us just how faithful he is. And that's not to say you don't take care of yourself. We all need to rest, eat right, and exercise, and have a plan, and steward what God's given you. But I don't want what I steward to become more important than the one who gave it to me two stories. I don't want to trust in the provision more than the provider. It makes sense. And so, how do we live into the story of Jesus? First, it's about seeing it, right? It's about repentance. It's about seeing that it's not just a standard to live up to, it's a story to live into, but then how do you live into it? It's about counting the cost. It's about recognizing this life is not about you, it's about him. And it's about giving your all follow Jesus. Oh, yeah. You'll never find your life saving. Yes. You only find your life losing it. Amen. 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 Let me pray for you instead. Let me close with this. I'm going to read this over you. Then just think of who this is. This is Saul. This is from Philippians chapter 3. Saul was this man who just, he thought he had everything going for him. And God strips it all away, and this is what he says. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I Counted his loss for the sake of Christ. And 
Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. It's not about getting through it. It's about getting into it. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him. Amen. And the power of his resurrection I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Amen. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, press. and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on press. toward the goal, for the prize, the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, let those who are mature think this way. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for demonstrations like this of a great man named Paul, that whose life you just completely turned upside down before the good. You put him through that three, the three days of darkness, not to fill him, to empty him. That this life is about emptying ourselves of everything we try to hold on to, in order that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I just pray over everyone here this morning, Lord God, help us to see the kingdom rightly. Help us to see you rightly. And God, that we would live into this kingdom by taking up our cross and following hard after you. We love you, Jesus. And God, I just pray on this journey of discovering you and your kingdom, God, that we would discover what life is truly all about. Father, as we, as we encounter people today on the beach, at the boardwalk, wherever it may be, at our jobs, Father, I just pray that you'd help us to see the kingdom in everything that takes place. That we have lives to impact that we were created for such a time as this. We're not just saved, we're called. And thank you, God, that we can live into and participate in the kingdom of our God. Bless this day, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone said. Amen.